I'm Sharon Tesser. I'm a fiber artist and I'm here today to talk to you about creating a textile mosaic. One of the biggest things that I've learned over the last year being at home as an artist is um, how important art is to people's homes and to bringing joy into their lives. Um, we were fortunate enough that there were some art fairs this winter and we were we're able to go to Florida, and that is the best way typically to see my art is in person at an art fair. But I'm really excited today to be able to share with you how and why I create what I create. Um, before I get very far into this story, I want to tell you that we have a pandemic puppy who is sleeping now. And if she wakes up, you will know it. <laughs> so I'm just giving you guys the heads up and we will do our very best to manage her um, if she gets loud. I also want to introduce you to my husband and business partner, Paul. He's going to say hi. Hello. <laughs> and, uh, I am the creator of the artwork, but I don't do anything without um, all of his support and help, all the traveling, the framing, the accounting, the mailing, you name it, we do it together. I am the creative side and the business is definitely a joint effort. So um, I work in fabric deliberately. I was a trained illustrator and could make things out of you know, colored pencil and paint and was sort of that kid in kindergarten where if the teacher said draw a cat, I came into the world with some natural ability and could draw a cat. But I went to college and got my BFA with a specialty in illustration. I spent several years freelancing doing editorial work for newspapers and books. And um, I just always looked at making art as storytelling. That's where my brain naturally goes. And after several years of freelancing, I got married, um, had a very big family. Paul and I are a blended second marriage family and uh, very proud and happy parents of seven children. And I spent 21 years at home as a stay-at-home mom. And while I was at home, I was making art in different ways and often using cloth. I got into making art quilts and would spend a lot of time at the sewing machine. I made kids clothes and just really loved putting things together using textiles. So textiles became my palette and how I started working on telling stories. Pattern was the way that I saw the world. So if you think of a traditional painter and they see things using light with their different colored paints, I started seeing the world through the shapes and the sizes of the patterns with the colors behind that. Um, it's a little bit hard to describe. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to show you a little bit later using different fabrics with different pattern sizes how my eyes and vision see them. So after making quilts for many years, um, we, we laugh about the idea that I fell out of love with my sewing machine. I think when true quilters talk about why they make what they make and how they do it, they have a, a love for the stitches. And I never did. For me, the sewing machine was a tool that put together pieces of fabric. And the more that I was sewing, the less I was enjoying what I was doing. The stitches never mattered to me. I definitely didn't enjoy hand stitching. It was a means to an end. And I began working on a process of putting the fabrics together in layers. And I call this process a textile mosaic. Um, I, I was not taught in college how to create that way, but it became a natural resource. I had fabrics all around me. I had always loved fabric and collected them. And there was an abundance of kids' clothes that weren't being used that were easy to cut up. So um, fabric just became my palette. And 
and over time I narrowed that down to only using natural fibers. Um, it's very important to me that the way the fabric handles light over time um, using cotton and silk, I could count on those fabrics being consistent, uh, especially in the way that I was treating them, that they would not respond to light over time, they would not deteriorate, they would not change, and I became very familiar with how they would handle as I cut them as well. Um, in my history, I have uh, one grandmother that worked in the garment district in New York as a seamstress. My other grandmother was a graphic designer and when I think about why I would be drawn to cloth, those two familial objectives of my grandmothers, the way that they worked and why they worked and how they worked, it seemed like a natural conclusion that I would be drawn to cloth. One of my earliest memories of, as a third grader, I would go home after school with a friend who had a babysitter and she set up sewing machines for us. She had piles of scraps of fabric and we would make our own Barbie clothes. So for as long as I can remember, I have always been drawn into different kinds of fabrics and knowing what fabrics could do, how much pleasure they would bring, what they felt like, what they looked like. I think just as a woman shopper, I have an appreciation for beautiful cloth. I collected vintage fabrics, so I have quite a lot of that, but I also recycle fabrics. And today as we're going through my process, I'm going to show you how I am working with, um, with clothing and recycling. It always makes me feel good to take one uh, object that has had a life, uh, a dress, pillowcases, curtains, um, and then turn that into a fabric that has now been over dyed or hand dyed and I'm using it in a permanent piece of art. So there are many kinds of fabrics that, that are out there and available to you. They're really available to everyone without having to go to an art supply store. Um, I, I think it's important to me that the images I make are stories. That's how I think about myself, is I am a storyteller. Maybe that's the illustration history in my background. I want you to see what I create and have a vision from my eyes and for you to accept that and see that it is meaningful to you or how it's meaningful to you. If you think about an author who's written a book, um, that same book could be the best story someone's ever read and it could also strike someone else completely differently and they not enjoy the book at all. I find that's very true in the art world that there are people who identify with my work and they understand what I'm trying to tell them, that they can see that vision through my eyes but they also feel something and it's meaningful to them. The most important thing I feel that I can do is to bring joy. So when people come into my art booth and they talk to me, why do you make what you make? I, I always repeat the same story. Is uh, There are many artists out there, everyone has this different point of view, they're all very unique. But if my work is hanging on your wall and you walk around the corner and you see it and it brings a smile, I've done my job. That's what I that's what I dream of is when someone identifies with my work, feels something and wants to live with it. There is really no greater honor as an artist for someone to choose my work and to do that. So, um, I'm going to describe for you where my images come from, which is they are drawings. Um, usually I'm drawing from life. I carry around a sketchbook and I'm going to show you that in a minute. But it is an interesting combination of drawing from life but also using my imagination. 
most artists choose one or the other, but for me, I, I've combined the two. So, um, I want to get my sketchbook out for you, and we are going to start talking about the how-tos of doing what I do. So this is my sketchbook, and um, carry this everywhere. I usually treat myself to nice ones. This one is made by another artist. Um, I will supply information on the products I use or uh, items I've purchased at the end of this program, or you can find them on my website. But um, this is a hand-bound sketchbook, and I carry them just for all my ideas in a little bit. You're going to see um, me working on the still life that I've set up, but I wanted to get my tools ready for you so that you understand everything that goes into making a piece of art. Um, once a while back at an artist's booth, I overheard him or someone asked, how long does it take you to make that? And that is a question I get. I can't even count how many times I've gotten that question. How long does it take you to make that? And his answer I thought was so great. I guess he was 66 years old because he said it took me 66 years. And the truth is that you can't create out of nothing. Every piece that I make is better for the last piece that I made before it. So. I'm always learning, I'm always changing, I feel like I'm growing, which is important as an artist. I don't do the same things over and over, um, and so it's just, I want you to see my tools and my process, and I stick to my process, but my imagery changes because my sketches change. If you looked at my sketchbooks at age 18 and age 30 and on and on, they're my sketches, you can see my hands, but you can also see the growth over time. And I love looking back at old sketches and choosing where my images are going to come from. But they always come from these hands, and I love that I'm not using a computer, or a sewing machine, or a photograph. All my own drawings. So, my basic tools, starting with the sketchbook. But next... So here we have a carpenter's pencil. If you've never seen one, it's pretty fun. I love it. And it comes with this really cool sharpener that you've probably never seen either because it's not like the ones that you had in school. And that was probably dated myself because kids probably had mechanical pencil. <laughs> um, number two pencil, pretty normal. Charcoal. This I use in every piece. There's something really wonderful about charcoal. It erases well, but there's always a little bit of a hint of what is left behind. And I, I just love it. I love the way it feels. I love the way it draws. I love everything about it. So almost all my work has charcoal in it. This is called a stump. And um, it's tightly rolled paper. And with the charcoal, you use this and can create some shaded line very easily. So for my artwork, when I'm doing those drawings, which I think is the most important piece of what I do, where if we think about my fabric being the palette, it's important, but the drawing underneath it is the most important part to me. So this is the stump that helps with the drawing. So the next part of what I need is the substrate. So that's going to be wood. And today um, we're going to be working on a small piece because I can't create I can't create a big piece fast enough for you. Honestly, in 40. 
45 minutes, I realized maybe if I was, you know, a watercolor artist, I could easily, in my own watercolor history, if you wanted me to make something small for you, I could do that in 45 minutes. Doing what I do with fabric, I can't make you a completed anything in 45 minutes. So we're going to do my very best to talk about all the different steps. Today we're going to be using a small wood panel. This can be purchased anywhere. Amazon, Dick Blick, Arteza, I buy them in packs of five. They're fairly inexpensive, very, very sturdy, and this is a really good size to work on. For my larger pieces, I get bigger pieces of wood. So this happens to be plywood. I don't use it often, but on occasion, it will be a backer board. Then this is a much, this one's a much, thinner piece of wood that you can see and that it my work my work always has to have wood behind it because I'm working in cloth there is a quality of it it's just it needs the support it's just too flexible without it so the next part of me creating a piece of art and this is integral to what I do this is wide weave gauze. It's very light. Here is 100 yards. I can buy it this way in a box. I can buy it in a bolt. You can buy it numerous different weights. Um, it is what you will see either very visibly in the work or sometimes hidden. On this piece behind me, um, if you get very close, you can see the gauze behind and that's where the dye sits on top of the wood with the gauze and then the fabric is placed over and under. So the next thing I want to do for you is a small dyeing demonstration. So I'm going to set myself up here. I think you might work okay. on that side. Go back around. So, this is your classic takeout container. I have too many of these. <laughs> lots and lots. I use them all the time. Um, and I have in here a combination of coffee and tea. I allow the tea leaves to be put in the boiling water loose as well as the coffee grounds. And this morning I dropped in my gauze and I want you to see that dark rich brown color and then over here is another fabric which had started out as a light off-white you can see that it's getting a nice rich brown color as well when i'm dyeing fabric i typically do not work small i will work in a big tub i like to work on a sunny day i like to work outside so that i'm able to um, just hang things out to dry but today i did want to give you just a little bit of an idea of how the dyeing happens. It, um, it doesn't take very long, but just talking about dyeing cloth, it literally could take my entire time. There are American dyes, there are natural dyes, there are vegetable dyes, Japanese dyes, French dyes, and each one has their own properties their own strengths, the reasons why artists like to use them. I have used a variety and depending on the cloth that I'm using, I will use a different dye, whatever seems necessary to the project. Um, today I chose the coffee dye, coffee and tea combination and I went ahead and got myself prepared. So I don't know if you ever watch TV where they're um, cooking <laughs> A cooking show and they show you the mixed stuff and then you get the finished product well in a little while I'm going to pull out what a finished piece looks like um, because it becomes 
just dying could take up a whole day describing for you what that looks like. So let me get to the next set of tools, which is so important to what I do. Scissors. Um, yet another tool that everyone has an opinion on, and depending on what they use their scissors for, and how often many um, people who are cutting fabric often will use a rotary cutter. But I don't like rotary cutters. Not a fan, never have been, even when I was a quilter. Um, this is the heaviest scissor I have. It's a Guggenheim scissor. I typically choose the cheapest scissors you could buy. And I buy a lot of them because I go through them fast. But um, for me, I need a very lightweight scissor. The hours that I spend cutting, and it is literally hours, weighs literally on my hands. So it's important to me to have lightweight scissors and cheap ones are the best for that. So today I'll be using um, some of my small scissors. Obviously small scissors with sharp point are going to do the very best job on tight corners and big scissors are what you want for a heavier weight fabric. My pieces of fabric that I use are never very large. If you can see behind me on this, this is a fairly large piece of art. It's probably 50 some odd inches by 50 inches and no piece of cloth is bigger than two inches by two inches. So that's a good estimate of how, what the size that I'm working with all the time. I also think this piece is wonderful for describing the mosaic quality of my work, where you can really see that it's one piece next to another piece next to another piece. So, um, I had talked about recycling and I'm going to do a little bit of impromptu recycling. We've got this great dress and I'm going to show you how to deconstruct a piece of cloth. So for me, it's important to have fabric that is somewhat organized because you can imagine there's a lot in my studio and if it's not organized, then it's chaos and I can't get my work done. So if you've decided you're going to deconstruct a piece of clothing, uh, sheets, pillowcases, everything has seams. So let's go ahead and turn this inside out so you can see the seams. And I don't ever grieve for the clothing. This once loved dress, um, nobody's wearing it anymore. And now it's time for it to have a new life and it's gonna get that wonderful new life and a beautiful piece of art. And I, that makes me happy. So taking a seam of the sleeve and I'm staying, I don't like to waste anything, but I will get rid of this tiny bit of seam. To me, it's not worth the time to pull out all those stitches for that little bit of fabric. So, don't have to be super careful. sleeve off. So when you're thinking about what fabrics do you have in your life that you don't necessarily wear anymore or use anymore but would like to experiment with, don't go for fabrics that are shiny Try to stick to those natural fibers. They are much easier to work with. One of the questions that I received um, on my Instagram was people talking about fraying. So this is a cotton fabric. And I have cut it, this little sleeve. This now would get folded and I will put it with all the rest of the cloth once, once I take the seams out and it will be a flat fold, but I am pulling on it 
and there is no fraying. It is just a simple cut. I Certain fabrics have problems with fraying, but I rarely come across that. So I'm gonna go with getting a little bit of a larger piece here from the body of the fabric. Um, people have asked me, well, where do you find your fabrics? And I don't do a lot of shopping for cloth. And so I will shop online. Uh, I will purchase things internationally. When we could travel, I would often look for interesting clothing used or um, fabric stores, but I really, really love the recycled and the vintage fabrics the best. So I'm not going to be able to take this whole cloth, deconstruct it today because there's just not enough time. But I do want you to see that large pieces are easy to get and they would be a flat fold. store that. We're going to come back to this piece a little bit later. And the next thing I want to talk to you about is making fabric from fabric. So is an original piece of art created all from fabric. You can see that wonderful wide weave gauze in the background. I call this piece the poppies. Once I had created this piece, I loved it and I wanted, I wished for it to be a piece of cloth. So, um, working with numerous printers, in America, around the world, I have had this piece reproduced and was able to create silk scarves. So I had the poppies printed on silk. Many artists have their original art printed onto paper and metal, and you think of those as reproductions. This is exactly that. It is a reproduction, and it is on silk, it's not on metal or paper. It could be, I've had the poppies printed onto paper, but this has been turned into fabric. So that was the silk for the scarves. This was turned into cotton and then created into a pillow. We went a little further and that cotton fabric was then turned into a back panel for a jacket. So it's this wonderful relationship. Um, I think of it like the Lion King, the circle of life, where I'm creating a piece of fabric art and having it turned into fabric, which is then turned into a scarf, a pillow, a jacket, a bolt of cloth. Um, it's really a very interesting way. Sometimes I have cut up my own scarves and use them in my artwork. So I wanted to talk to you just about how fabric gets made. I often will cut up little pieces from the fabric I have to create a pattern in the artwork that I'm making. So let me set this down and the next thing I want to demonstrate for you is the actual drawing that I would do for a still life. So today I've set up a very simple traditional
traditional still life. We've got a great artisan made ceramic bowl and lemons. So I talked to you about how important it is to me to do the drawing. We need to start with the drawing for me to create the art. I use a line drawing and that's for the sketchbook and I always use a pen. And when you use a pen, you make mistakes and it doesn't matter because you can't erase them. And it forces me to just stay in the drawing and not worry about it being perfect. So I'm gonna do a quick line drawing here. And if you are someone who is not comfortable drawing, but wants to create art using fabric, feel free to use photographs. Drawing is important to me. That doesn't mean it's the only way to make art. It's just, um, I think there, I think what I do is very unique. And part of that is because of the drawing I create. I don't expect everyone to be me. I'm hoping that you're inspired to work with cloth after today. And I want you to use whatever tools would make you feel happy and comfortable creating in your own home. So this isn't a very complex drawing. Clearly, it's just a straight line drawing. Okay. Um, I'm gonna leave that there. That is the simple sketch that I would use before I move forward on the piece that I'm gonna work on today. I will give an imaginary um, line, a horizon line, and I had spoken earlier about how I do a combination of imagination and real. Well, that, that's gonna be my horizon. So I'm gonna set this aside and go ahead and get the next part of how I work. I told you that earlier I dyed some coffee gauze and I wanted to prep in advance because this does take time to dry. When people ask, well, do you work on just one piece at once? And no, I can never work on just one piece at once because something is always drying and something is being sketched on and I'm doing several things at one time. So I always have three or four things at different stages. And so this is the very beginning. If I were not doing this with you today, I would do another layer of coffee dye on top of this. I would use a brush, I would hopefully have a sunny day, and it would be a shade darker. But it, it dried a little bit lighter, and we don't have time to do that. So I'm just gonna move forward. So, grabbing the tools I talked about earlier, I'm gonna save the charcoal for later. Um, it, it just seems like it would be overkill on something that's as light as this is. So I'm gonna get that drawing on here using the carpenter pencil. I'm not sure if you can see, it's very light. So I'm roughing in the size of the bowl and this size piece of art that I'm working on was sort of um, 
something that happened organically during COVID. I typically had been doing very large pieces and decided to start working smaller and I called this series my little gem series and I was able to sell many of these on Instagram. I was very surprised and happy by the wonderful people who have reached out over the last year and wanted to purchase art. So I'm doing a very, very, very simple drawing also, sort of a combination of my sketch and the original art, getting all those lemons in there. And I don't get wound up about something looking perfect. I always come back to, is it joyful? Is it going to be joyful? So that's really important for the next step of what I do, which is going to be choosing cloth. So, um, which side? I knew that I was going to be making this still life for you today and I wanted to have everything ready so sometimes I could sit in the studio and take a very long time um, deciding on the kinds of fabric that I am going to use but today we got to pick in advance to be all ready for you so really beautiful yellows juicy yellows and different turquoise for the bowl. And this is where imagination comes in. So obviously I don't have anything that even resembles something as um, just bold as this fabric is. But I think this would make a beautiful table. So it's a bit of imagination in there. And then for background, I'm gonna go back to the fabric that I cut from the dress, and I think I'm going to use that. This looks like it would be an interesting combination. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about before I get into cutting this is how I choose fabric. So I don't have you upstairs in the studio with me today. There are thousands and thousands of fabric piles <laughs> that are neatly organized, but they are piles. When a painter is making something that's white, there are, I don't know, go to the craft store, maybe there's a hundred whites to choose from. Think about how many whites there are in fabric. It's, I think it's infinity, because as soon as you're you've gotten every fabric in the universe that has white, there's more being created. There's just so many of every single color. So I love that I have a wall of whites with which literally hundreds of choices based on pattern size of what I want to use. In the last year I've started experimenting with matte fabrics. And this is something that where people see them and they, they see the art that's been created with the maps and they say, oh, well, you used a map and that's paper. And I say, no, I'm using a map and it's cloth. And as I showed you before, I can take anything that I've created and turn it into fabric with a photograph. Anybody can do that. You, you know, Spoon Flower, there's a hundred companies out there that will turn whatever you want into fabric. So I'm really, it's unlimited. If I can't dye the fabric that I want exactly the color that I want it to be, I can also buy the fabric uh, to be exactly what I want to be. I wanted to show how I used a map fabric to create skin, which is just such an interesting departure when you think about what is skin. Well, first, skin color can be, we know there's quite a range, but to choose this, which is has a 
blue tint to it, but it's also got all those lines and valleys and mountains and roads. And it just is, um, it, it serves me well to think about skin as words. So I have moved in the last year using different matte fabrics. Um, we are not going to have enough time today for me to go through the steps that it would take to make this one little piece because I just don't have the time <laughs> and I the pieces would be small um, they I have a completed uh, completed little gems and they are teeny tiny pieces that create those wings it's important to note that I do it with a brush. So let me just show you that. Um, I am using an archival adhesive system. So this is my brush and you can see all the, <laughs> the days that this brush has worked. And in varying layers with water added step by step, um, until we get to the end. The end would be an archival seal. And that is so important. The seal uh, protects the artwork from light. Uh, as a quilter, I really had to worry about gravity and hand oils and light. And this hard seal, people can touch it, we can wipe it down, it can be in our sunniest room. It will not fade. It won't yellow. And it remains unchanged. Completely UV protected. Does not need glass. So um, I just really enjoyed being with you today. And it's exciting. It was a little nerve wracking. I'm not much of a public speaker. I am thrilled that the dog slept through it <laughs> and that we didn't hear from her. So um, if you have questions, I would love to get to them. I will be sending you to my website. And if you have time and are interested in what I'm doing in an ongoing way, you can sign up for my newsletter. I try to do that four times a year. Um, there is a website for all my wearables, which are scarves, jackets, pillows, fabrics, if you're interested in that. Follow me on Instagram if you want to see what I'm doing on a daily basis. I try to post five out of seven days just to keep people up to what, you know, up to date to what I'm doing because it does change from day to day and I think it's pretty interesting to see pieces go from beginning to end and um, I hope that, that this brought you joy. It brought me a lot of joy sharing with you today. So thank you for your time and I hope I see you in person sometime in the future.